Good evening, everyone. Just make sure everyone can hear me okay. All right. So good day all. Um, as most of you know, my, my name is Lieutenant Commander Anna Cocott. On behalf of the Royal Alberta United Services Institute, welcome to this evening's Rocky Mountain Conference on Security and Defense Seminar. Formed in 1920 as a think tank, Rousey later evolved into a service organization for veterans in the decades following the World Wars. In this new era, Rousey has evolved back into a think tank, publishing original content, curating articles, and sponsoring speakers to present original thought on global security and defense issues. The Institute welcomes global civilians, humanitarians, military, and international police communities as members. This evening, we are excited to have Commander Nicole Robichaud, Commanding Officer of HMCS Margaret Rook, joining us from the East Coast. So a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, first, uh, just to let you know, we have a number of upcoming confirmed events, specifically our next RMCSD event will take place on the 22nd of June. And this is where Major General Chip Chapman will be doing a presentation on war and warfare in Ukraine. Additionally, if you are interested in joining Rousey, the memberships are now $10, and you are welcome to visit our website for any other information. For question and answers, for this or question and answer protocol for this evening, uh, there will be a time for questions at the end of the presentation. So for those of you that are on Zoom, you can either raise your hand by clicking the little hand icon, or you can just simply into the chat box or into the message box, you can type, I have a question. And then I will call on you when it's your turn. And for anyone that is uh, in the room itself, just feel free to raise your hand. So Commander Robichaud is originally from Red Deer, Alberta. She joined the regular force in 2002 as a Naval Warfare Officer. After several years at sea, including eight months in New Zealand, uh, and uh, sailing with the New Zealand Navy, she moved to Ottawa in 2015 to work at Strategic Joint Staff as the Rules of Engagement Officer. In 2016, she was posted to Halifax and assumed the role of commanding officer of HMCS Moncton, where in one year, Moncton sailed north to the Canadian Arctic across and across the Atlantic Ocean to West Africa, conducting community relations in Senegal, Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Cote d'Ivoire. In 2018, Commander Robichaud attained her master's in defense studies and assumed the role of executive officer of HMCS Fredericton. Her time in Fredericton included executing a high readiness program and a deployment to the Mediterranean in 2020. In 2021, Commander Robichaud assumed command of HMCS Margaret Brook, the second offshore patrol vessel and the RCM's newest commissioned ship. So it is my pleasure this evening to welcome Commander Nicole Robichaud. Okay, excellent. Um, so yes, thank you for the introduction and thank you for uh, um, introducing me and uh, inviting me to go and talk to, uh, to your organization. Uh, I do have a brief pre uh, presentation to put together or that I've put together. And then uh, uh, following that, like you mentioned, there'll be some question period and uh, yeah, I'll answer the, uh, the questions they have as best as possible. I do apologize, it's late in Halifax, it's normally my bedtime, but uh, so if I yawn, it's not because uh, you're being bored, it's just, it's, it's or I'm being bored, it's my, my, my bedtime, past my bedtime. <laughs> so with that being said, I think I'll uh, start sharing my screen and get on with the presentation. There, everyone see the presentation? Yeah, excellent, Let's see some thumbs up. Okay, so uh, first of all, we'll just start off with some of the, the ship's capabilities. Uh, I had to go and throw in some, some cool pictures because uh, our year that we've had, or year and a half that we've been operational, we've done some uh, pretty neat stuff. Uh, the ship was accepted uh, by the RCN on July 15th in 2021. And in that time period from there, uh, we've gone and participated in uh, cold weather or ice trials. And that's the photo that you see up in your, your the top uh, left-hand corner. Uh, we've gone down, uh, down south to do warm weather trials, um, various trials in between. And then this past summer, we went and operated in uh, for Operation Inuk. And the photo that you see on the right-hand side is that's uh, the ship going and driving through some old ice. Very neat um, and very fun to go and do, very powerful ship. 
So with that being said, there's a short little video. Sheets of ice, icebergs, and cold Arctic winds aren't the only thing found in Canada's northernmost coasts. Now there's something a little different. The new Arctic and offshore patrol ships are designed with a thick, robust hull that will allow them to break through over a meter of first-year ice. Bow thrusters on either side of the hull allow the ship to maneuver and berth without the assistance of tugboats, making it very agile. The ship is 103 meters in length and 19 meters wide, making it noticeably shorter in length than the Halifax-class frigates. However, the Harry DeWolf displaces almost 2,000 tons more water than its counterpart. In order to propel and power a vessel of this size, the Harry DeWolf class is equipped with two 4.5 megawatt diesel propulsion engines and four 3.6 megawatt electric generators. On the front of the ship, the enclosed forecastle protects the crew and the cable deck machinery from the harsh Arctic environments. Directly above the enclosed forecastle, boasts a modified remote controlled 25 millimeter BAE Mark 38 gun system, which features highly accurate targeting and surveillance system that allows the M242 cannon to excel against fast surface and air threats. In combination with two mounted 50 caliber machine guns, the Harry DeWolf class has enough firepower to easily enforce domestic laws from coast to coast to coast. The integrated bridge enables the control of navigation, machinery, and damage control systems. This state-of-the-art bridge gives the captain a great overview of everything going on around the ship at all times. Just below the bridge are multi-role rescue boats. These boats extend the reach of the ship by assisting in search and rescue missions personal transfers, and boarding operations. The Harry DeWolf class houses a lot more than just rescue boats. The stern of the ship contains a vehicle bay, allowing it to carry vehicles such as pickup trucks, ATVs, and snowmobiles, as well as other heavy payloads. Built into the stern of the ship are two cranes, a three-ton crane and a 20-ton crane that can load vehicles and payloads when needed. The flight deck allows the Harry DeWolf class to also embark some of the largest helicopters in NATO. These capable and multifunctional Arctic and offshore patrol ships are at the core of increasing Canada's armed presence and surveillance throughout Canadian and international waters. see by the computer animation of the ship the ship is is, is very very big we displace uh, 7000 tons um we can go and break up to 1 meter of first year ice whereas uh when we went and did our ice trials back in february last year uh the ship was easily breaking through almost 2 meters worth of ice so uh very powerful now it's not the the ship's purpose is not to go and operate regularly in ice but it's nice that to know that we have that capability of when we are operating up in the Arctic, um, then we, we can get a, get around safely. Um, the, the flight deck is huge, so it can go and easily accommodate our cyclone helicopters that we use with the, that the Air Force uses. It is big enough just for a size comparison. It actually can fit a Chinook helicopter sideways, not that we would ever do that. 
but uh, just the, the size of the, the flight deck is immense. And that goes and provides a lot of opportunities for um, uh, other missions that I'll get on uh, later on in the brief. Uh, the one thing I do wish also that the computer animation showed is that uh, we do have a landing craft that goes and fits on the quarter deck that's uh, lift, uh, lifted by the 20 ton crane out to sea, which goes and enhances our ability of moving the cargo uh, to and from uh, communities up north. Uh, not a lot of the communities up north have a suitable docks that we can go and use um, to go and birth the la like birth our small boats. So the landing craft is, uh, is excellent for going and beaching in those communities. Uh, so just a little bit about uh, Margaret Brook and the ship. So um, Margaret Brook, HMCS Margaret Brook is named after the nursing sister Margaret Brook. She was a, a nurse in the Second World War. Uh, there's another short little video um, also. The, the picture on the left is when uh, she was just a new recruit. And the picture on the right uh, is her um, just after the uh, representatives from the, uh, the Navy went and told her that a ship would be named, uh, named after her. And this one's on her 100th birthday. So it was quite neat that she was alive uh, and got to know that a ship would be named after her. Born in 1915 in Ardath, Saskatchewan, Margaret Martha Brooke enrolled in the Royal Canadian Navy as a nursing sister dietitian on March 9, 1942, at the rank of sub-lieutenant. She ultimately attained the rank of lieutenant commander on April 1, 1957, while serving in the Royal Canadian Navy from 1942 to 1962. On May 12, 1942, the Battle of the St. Lawrence began with a German U-boat sinking a British steamer just north of the Gaspé Peninsula. Within a few months, 14 merchant and naval ships were sunk in Canadian waters. The mortal danger to all ships was well understood. On the night of October 14, 1942, 75 kilometers off the coast of Newfoundland, U-69 was searching for targets and at 3.21 a.m fired a torpedo that struck Newfoundland's passenger ferry, the SS Caribou. Brooke and fellow nursing sister Sub-Lieutenant Agnes Wilkie were thrown from their bunks when the torpedo hit. They scrambled to the deck to find the remaining lifeboats and splinters and were thrown into the icy water as the ship sank beneath them. Brooke and Wilkie managed to cling to the side of a capsized lifeboat, holding on to some ropes still attached to the boat. After a few hours, Wilkie no longer had the strength to hold on, and Brooke pulled her back onto the side of the lifeboat a number of times while holding onto the ropes with the other hand. Around daybreak, a large wave crashed over the lifeboat and Wilkie was swept away from Brooke's grip, succumbing to the frigid water. For trying to save Wilkie in this selfless act, Brooke was named a member of the Order of the British Empire. Um, so with all the uh, Arctic offshore patrol vessels, they are named after people, uh, vice uh, cities like we received with our Halifax class, and they're all uh, Canadian war heroes. So uh, we're very lucky to be named after Margaret Brooke, and she has, a, she has quite the story uh, that goes behind her. Um, if you see a ship's crest, and I should have put a, a picture of the ship's crest, we have uh, a, a, the, the caribou. That's part of our ship's crest, and that goes and symbolizes uh, the SS Caribou, the, the ferry boat that was sank. Uh, and then there's also a four-leaf clover on uh, on the, our, core, our ship's crest as well. And the significance of the four-leaf clover is that um, when uh, when Margaret was going and helping out one of her one of the soldiers in the hospital, uh, the soldier went and attributed her care to saving uh, his life. So he went and gave her a four leaf clover. He said that the reason why he's still alive is that her help went in and saved him. Uh, he was kept safe by this four leaf clover, so he wants her to be safe. 
Uh, so after she was rescued from the water, uh, she put her hand into her pocket and she actually pulled out the four leaf clover that the soldier had given her. So um, when she got all recuperated from, uh, from the incident and all that stuff, she called her brother back home in Saskatchewan saying that, I think I'm truly alive because I have this four leaf clover that was given to me by the soldier. Uh, so it's something that has been kept within the family. Um, that four leaf clover, uh, the, the family, the Brooke family themselves are big sailors. They moved to, to Vancouver and Victoria and they took up sailing. Um, well, they took that four leaf clover and they mounted it into a locket. Uh, and uh, the families put that on their sailboats whenever they would go sailing and to keep the sailboat safe. The nice thing about uh, having a ship named after a person is that we have connections with that family. So that family has now donated that locket with the four leaf clover that survived the sinking of the SS Caribou. Uh, we have that on board ship. One of our sailors went in, made a nice picture frame for it and mounted it um, and uh, has a nice little prayer and the well wishes from the Brooke family. And it's uh, displayed in a prominent place on the bridge so that, or like, uh, sorry, on the way up to the bridge. So anyone going up to the bridge uh, will be able to see this four leaf clover. So really quite neat. It's a, uh, not like naval tradition to have uh, ships named after people or not Canadian naval tradition anyways, um, but it's nice to have that connection with, uh, with the family. So now I guess into the meats and potatoes of, uh, of the brief and why you're all sitting here and, and we're talking about uh, security. Uh, so operational areas for the AOPVs. Um, obviously we've operated up in, up in the Canadian Arctic and we've operated in our waters. Uh, Harry the Wolf is the first uh, AOPV um, that was uh, put into action, and she actually went and circumnavigated North America. So she went to, uh, through the Northwest Passage, uh, down into Victoria, stayed in Victoria for, for a couple months, or probably about a month, month and a half, before she went and headed down south. She participated in Operation Crib, which is uh, our counter drug um, operation that we conduct with the American Coast Guard. She went through the canal and then transited back up to Halifax. So we have operated all around North, Amer or North uh, America uh, and in the Car Caribbean. Uh, in the near future, uh, we're going to extend the boundaries of the AOPVs and start operating in international waters and overseas. Uh, Harry DeWolf is scheduled to go and work with an op projection, so she'll be going heading over to Africa. And then in the next year, uh, Margaret Brooke is actually scheduled to go and uh, conduct an exercise ball tops working with the, the Norwegian uh, and, and Finland navies uh, with uh, some of our exercises over in that area. So it's it's it's, it's just a matter where we're getting these, working on getting these ships operational, figuring out what they can go and do. And then uh, in my mind, we're too small of a Navy for a ship just to be able to go and do one thing. So we're, we're branching out and expanding uh, what these ships will, will do in the future. What are we focusing on so far or what, and, and what we, are we going to be looking forward to the future? So uh, big support to other government departments in support of uh, domestic sovereignty and enforcement patrols. Uh, we'll support the, the other DG, uh, off, uh, the government uh, departments and, and see how uh, we can operate together, both like mainly up in the north, because that's what we're working on. Everyone has very limited experience working up north. Um, so uh, we will see that within our domestic waters. Uh, search and rescue operations. You've seen the size of the ship. Uh, we have an excellent platform for launching helicopters. We have uh, very robust uh, boats. Uh, so more like we'll participate in search and rescue operations. Uh, humanitarian assistance and disaster relief. So uh, Margaret Brooke was fortunate to, to go and participate in Op Lentis uh, at the end of uh, Nanook last year, where we went and um, provided assistance uh, after Hurricane Fiona hit uh, Nova, uh, sorry, Newfoundland. And instead of going and sending our uh, frigates to go and help out with hurricane relief, like uh, normally is done, say in Haiti, uh, these ships will, I see, taking that role over because they're better suited uh, for that role itself. We already do a whole bunch of uh, support to science research and development. DRDC is constantly working with our ships. Um, 
want to go and figure out how we can go and conduct science and operations better up north. And then two, uh, to see what we can go and do with this platform. Uh, the idea of going and doing plug and play, so depending on what your mission set will be, uh, we can go and sit, stick a sea can uh, in the back on the, on, the, on the quarter deck, plug it into a power source, hook up some cables, and then who knows what we can do. We're looking at passive soda, we're looking at electronic warfare, uh, of course there will be drones, UAVs, uh, all in that, thought, that think box as well. So uh, the brainiacs, the people that they, they're paid to go and do this and they have a lot bigger brains than me. Um, the, 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 I don't know, it's the world's and what they can do with their science and research is, is amazing what uh, it's, it's amazing what they can think of, what they've already thought of. And then uh, security. So as mentioned, the ships already participated down south in a counter a drug with uh, the American Coast Guard. But we also want to go and tie that in with, uh, say, what the RCMP, the knowledge that the RCMP has, and stop uh, the, the counter drug coming uh, coming up north to, to Canada. Uh, what's not mentioned in here is also fishery patrols will uh, embarking um, uh, DFO to see how we can go and assist them as well for for fish, fishery patrols. Here's just another uh, picture. We like little charts saying what we can go and do. Uh, nothing really different from what I've already talked about. Uh, we're uh, maybe possibly environmental stewardship. We're always reporting when we're up north to go and if we, we see any um, vessels that are po possibly polluting the northern waters. Uh, we're also going and reporting what kind of wildlife we go and see. Um, Department of Fisheries, Environment Canada Fisheries and uh, Fishery Enforcement, CBSA. Uh, CBSA is really... Um, they're trying to, like all the organizations with RCP, CPSA, they're figuring out how once the Northwest Passage opens up, how do we start controlling and regulating uh, and patrolling that better within all organizations? And uh, uh, we're playing a, a major role in helping uh, other organizations go and uh, develop their, their terms of reference or, or procedures and of how they will do that. Um, we've been working with a, a lot of defense within North America uh, and our own government. So uh, Canadian Army has come on board to see what, can, what how they can operate with us. Um, we have a nice uh, embarked forces mess, which is uh, 20 people that is actually designed for, uh, say if we bring army people on, they walk into this, this mess area, 20 bunks, they take off their rucksacks, they're assigned some lockers and some, um, some bunks they have their own sustained like heads and wash places, so showers and toilets. Uh, they have their own little armories and their their ammunition control, and then they pick up their stuff and walk right off there or get right off the ship. So it's an area, particularly for these embarked forces, that doesn't interfere with the ship's crew. So they have their own little briefing area that doesn't go and interfere with the the ship's crew. Obviously, they eat in the same area, but. Um, it's, it's a matter of how do we go and work with them and transport them from point A to point B. And we do the same thing with, uh, with SOF as well. So we've had them come on board and put their boats on board to see if, uh, if it works. Uh, they've also come and operated with our small boats to see if it, how good our, our, small, our small boats are compared to what they have. Uh, on the far right, the bigger bubble support science talked about that. Uh, Northern community support. So uh, the objection is not for, or the object of us is not just to go up north and say, hey, we know how to do business up here. We're on the maritime, like we're a maritime force. The, the object is to go and work with the Northern communities and listen to what they, what the Northern communities see to go and work together to figure out how to uh, better operate and patrol up north. Uh, there are eyes and ears up north throughout the year, whereas our navigable season up north is still relatively short for, for the, the, the time being. Um, we're working with Coast Guard regularly to figure out if uh, how to go and respond to, say, if one of the Arctic um, adventures, there's huge cruise lines doing Ar Arctic adventures. What if they, they have a disaster or um, they go aground or something like like humanitarian assistance. So we're working with them to go and figure out how to best um, respond. And like I said, there's disaster release and search and rescue. 
Um, so just some of our cool photos that I have posted here uh, from the nooks in the center, the polar bears. We saw lots of polar bears this summer and uh, all the polar bears that we've reported recorded the lats and longs so that that can be passed on for, uh, uh, passed on just to maintaining environmental stewardship. Um, we never got any close to them. That's a, that's a drone footage. So it looks like it's close, but it, it's not, uh, it's quite high up in the, uh, the, uh, the sky. Uh, the top left corner, we had RCMP on board. Uh, we had about five waves of RCMP officers come on board this past summer uh, and just working from all different detachments up north. And like I said, coming and figuring out how we can go and better work together uh, with the RCMP. They have intel, that's the intel between our two organization mesh. Um, how, how can they use our vessels to, to transport their officers? Uh, we have the Jayada uh, South uh, Ships Crest or badge there. We work with Jayada quite uh, regularly. Uh, we go and report derelict vessels. So that, that's what you see in the bottom uh, left-hand corner. Uh, in the top right-hand corner, that's a picture of uh, Rangers and uh, a cadet group from, uh, from Hopedale, which is one of our affiliated communities up north. And then in the bottom right, we had... Um, we had a, a team of 13 surgeons, both Canadian and American, come on board to see how they can go and change our sick bay, which is very robust, into a surgical unit. Uh, they ended up bringing something like 16 or 17 huge boxes of equipment on board, and in the end, to go and convert our hospital, our sick bay, into a, a, a role two hospital. Uh, providing surgical care, um, they only need about three three boxes full of the equipment. It's a very robust sick bay, uh, partially because um, when you're operating up north, you will not have the opportunity, or you won't always have the opportunity to to evacuate a person quickly. Um, so the doc can go and be may have to perform surgery, and we may have to keep a patient on board for for days, be, depending on the weather. A frigate doesn't have as robust of a of a sick bay, um, partly because uh, they're normally operating with a helicopter and they can usually get a person off the ship within like a 24 hour period. Um, but it's also the frigates are, are 30 years old, so I like to think that we've we've learned from um, our 30 years of experience with the uh, with the frigates. Talked about search and rescue. The ship is built with a with an in suite like a command center, so we do have a robust a robust command and control capabilities to act as on scene commanders. Um, we're not operating with helos yet, but that's just a matter of time. And the concept of operations for these uh, ships is that not only to be working with our 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 cyclone helicopters, but also with Coast Guard. So they're little bell helicopters. So that'll go and provide um, better capabilities and more assets that we can go in and uh, utilize. And when we're up there in the summer, we're constantly uh, liaising with the Coast Guard to, to figure out where all the ships are so that we can go and um, provide capable SAR assets um, to the Arctic, spread around the, the Arctic and the uh, Northern AORs. Um, and then, as mentioned, the med medical facility that we have, we, we, we could go and handle a potential mass, uh, mass casualty response. Hurricane and disaster relief. I touched on this. So we have vehicles and landing crafts. We have multi-role boats. Uh, we have booms. We have cranes. We have that embarked forces mess. Uh, on the video, the first video mentioned that uh, the, the vehicle bay can go and take up to uh, pickup trucks, they say a three quarter ton pickup truck. Um, if you're actually in the vehicle bay, it's actually a little bit tinier, which I don't think could fit a pickup truck in. But when we're, we're operating up north, we're not we're not going to be pickup trucks aren't, aren't, aren't a practical uh, asset anyways we're going to be operating with or delivering and working with snowmobiles quads side by sides and this vehicle bay is a perfect uh, uh perfect for those vehicles uh we do have the impacts or we can bring in embarked air debt so that goes and just uh, widens her horizon as, as to what we can do and the amount of area that we have between the flight deck and the quarter deck um 
there's different configurations that we can go and do different tie downs and lockdowns that we can go take up to I think it's 12 C cans of um, of material of gear. So if we do end up going down to say for Haiti for hurricane relief, we can go and take a whole ton of equipment that necessary that, that, that a frigate necessarily can't take and by having it on our our our, our flight deck it we can work in conjunction with other other um uh other nations to go and get that uh, hurricane relief equipment to uh ashore and um like i mentioned for op Lentis, so this past summer when hurricane fiona went and hit uh margaret Brooke was actually on a port visit in St. John's after two months up in the Arctic. Our, our port visit got cut short and we got retasked to go and help out with Op Lentis. And we were tasked to go and check in on five um, Newfoundland communities that were only accessible by boats. So uh, they had no roads, <laughs> they had no airports. Uh, so we went and checked in on these five communities. We did a quick assessment, talked with the key leadership within the communities to see if there's anything that we could have readily done. There was a lot of devastation in some of the communities, um, but we can't go and we weren't capable of fixing the houses that were blown down. We did stop at this one community, La Poyle, it was a community of about 60 people where the average age was 70, 75 years old. Um, and they, the, the type of devastation that they saw is, is a fishing community. All their fishing traps were blown into the water. Uh, if you look at the picture on the right, that, that's uh, one gentleman's woodshed and had all the wood, like a year's worth of wood in there to keep his, his stove and, um, and heat going. It was teetering. Uh, just on an edge, we went and secured it, unloaded all the wood, um, and then brought that shed back onto uh, steady, sturdy land. Uh, we went and, uh, I don't know, helped out and shored some of their, their shacks, their boat shacks that they had. So the work, we did it for, for a day and they were sending two work parties ashore, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. And the amount of work that uh, the crew of HMCS Margaret Brooke did in that one day, uh, save probably about three months of work that that this aging community would have um, it would have taken at least three months to go and get done. So we have the capability of reaching these uh, these communities that are only accessible by boat and providing uh, these tools and assets to uh, to the communities. Interdiction operations. So mentioned we have some uh, very high. Uh, highly technical boats with the uh, AIS capability, radar capability. So that only goes and extends our horizon even more into uh, over the horizon. So already worked with the American Coast Guard and they, uh, they like working with our ships. They like working with our boats. Uh, our embarked forces mess, as mentioned before, allows the, 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 um, the boarding team because to keep in mind the, the, the crew size of the, of the AOPVs, we're, we only have 87 bunks on board. The complement of core crew is about 65 to 70, and then uh, it allows enough room to go and embark uh, a, a boarding party team um, and various mission set personnel specialists that we can go and do. Uh, a frigate has 250 people, so they, they have the ability to have an organic boarding party uh, and a lot more organic uh, capabilities with, with respect to personnel on board, whereas we just don't have that just because of the size of the crew. Um, but the ship is built that we can go and accommodate. Uh, we have the op space, we have the briefing space, we have the, the armory for them, we have the sleeping arrangement for them. Uh, so it, it works really well. And the boats, the boats are very effective over the horizon, like I said, with the, the radar and AIS. Uh, the also nice thing about the boats is that um, where you, you saw the pictures in the first video, we can go and load that boat with eight people on board and launch it in the water and recover it. Whereas um, how we do boat operations on the frigate, you can only go and launch with two people and then you have to go and do a sticking drill where then embark the rest of the people through a, through a jumping ladder, which is probably one of the most dangerous evolutions that you can do with boat ops uh, uh, with the frigate. Other potential missions, well, sovereign patrol is not a potential mission. We go and do it 
uh, multi-domain awareness, counter-terrorist ops, strategic and domestic and international engagements, um, really uh, we're new with the AOPVs and uh, as we figure out what they can do, uh, we are going to go and see these ships go do more and more. Now, are we ever going to be put into a theater of operations? Uh, I don't think we'll be put into the thick of a theater of operations just because we only have the 25 millimeter gun to go and protect us. And we're not being like, we don't have any missile systems or torpedo systems, but we do, uh, we would be a good like hub for uh, if we went and did mount, uh, mine countermeasures and have, uh, we could be the control hub, the control ship and have a, a fleet of um, mine countermeasure ships uh, around us where we can control them from. So it's a great command platform. Uh, we're, we're developed for that kind of command platform um, and embarking staff, we've proven that we can go and embark a staff uh, and control multi-ships uh, as we, we did with the Nook. So it's, uh, it's just where the eyes and where the horizon will take us and what, what people can think of outside the box in order to go and uh, figure out what other potential missions will do. Uh, and the two pictures that we have here is at the bottom bottom left we're working with Triton one of our uh, uh, one of our ships uh, Danish ship uh, over for for Nanook and then uh, on the bottom right we went and got to do some uh, navigational training up in the, in the fjords of northern uh, Labrador and the uh, the mountains there were just as, if not more picturesque than the, the Rockies, but the only difference between that is that um, millions and millions and millions of people have seen the Rockies, where I probably, you're, you're limited to a couple thousand people have seen the fjords of northern Labrador. Um, so it was very beautiful, very serene, and like uninhabited, untouched. It was, it was absolutely beautiful. And that picture is Margaret Brook in the front with our task group for um, op Operation Nook and the ships that we worked with this past summer. And we'll do some questions, but I just want to explain the picture on the left there. Um, when we're going and doing our ice trials uh, back in last February, uh, the ship stopped in the ice to go and do some different engine configurations. And as we were stopped in the ice, we went in, uh, one of our contractors went and said, oh, polar bear off of our uh, uh, port quarter. So then we went and sort of locked down the ship just in case uh, the polar bear tried to get on board. Um, well, the, the smell of the, the black water is on the port side and the smell of the galley is on the starboard side. So the, the polar bear jumped over our wake, came and started sniffing the ship uh, and I think if I didn't sign the ship's horn, then the polar bear would have invited himself on board. But we got a kiss anyway, so we think it's some sort of uh, good luck. And that is the conclusion of my brief. I am open for questions. Commander Robichaud, it's uh, Major Howard in Calgary. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Thank you very much. Thank you for a brilliant presentation. And thanks, Anna, for lining this up. Um, can we move from the tactical to the strategic? Um, and I'd like to get your opinion of what Canada's claim to the Arctic comprises. We speak of Canada's Arctic as though the Arctic is Canada's domain. But with an international law background that I've got, I'm mindful that there's only 12 nautical miles of territorial sea, after which it's, it's uh, I think, 300 miles of exclusive economic zone. Can you share your thoughts? What Where does Canada's, interests lie in protecting what it, what we like to call Canada's Arctic, when in fact it may be more than just Canada's <laughs> Arctic. Yeah, so Canada makes claim to uh, like our, all of the Arctic 
archipelago. I have such a hard time with that word. Uh, so go, that goes and extends right up to the, the, the polar ice cap. And that's what, what Canada's claim is. Uh, so the whole purpose is that we want to go and show that we can go and patrol up there. Um, understand that everyone is going and putting claims. There's a lot of resources, yeah. everyone, uh, as even like China's going and putting claims because they have, uh, I took some of this in, in staff college and they said, oh, well, we have a, a third of the world's population, so we should be entitled to uh, some of the, like a third of the, the, the natural resources under the Arctic. Um, so lots of still science and research going in and, and um, part of the UNCLOS, uh, but Canada's claim yeah. is the Ar Arctic, Ar Arctic archipelago, so up to the yeah. northern tip of the island and then uh, exercising our, um, our our economic zone territorial seas after that. Um, and so just at a cute, like for the summer, um, we wanted to sort of push the envelope to see how far north we could get. Yeah. And on the Canadian side, we actually poked our nose into the polar ice cap. So we got up to 78 degrees north, um, which is the highest that furthest north on the Canadian side. So not through the Bering Sea, but on the Canadian side that uh, a Canadian warship has been. Yeah, I know that those claims are before a UN tribunal, and they are going to take a number of years to settle. But you've answered the question that Canada's reach goes up to the polar ice cap. Yes, sir. Sorry, does. Canada's claim. Claim. Canada's claim, claim yeah. reaches up. Okay, good stuff. Thank you very much. Not a problem. Thanks for the good question. Thank you for the question, Joe. So we've got a couple more questions here in the chat. Um, also, anyone in the room, if you do have a question, just feel free to put up your hand, um, and then I'll call on you, and then you can come up to the mic and ask your question. Um, so we have a question um, stating, could you haul 150 infantry soldiers up to some place in the Arctic? Uh, I think 150 is uh, pushing the boundaries quite a bit. Uh, Depending on how long we could take them on, like I, I, I mentioned 20, so so the ship's meant for 20 embark forces uh, for bunks. However, being army goers and how rough, tough neck they are, we could probably increase that number by by a little bit more, but definitely not 150. We'd need a, a whole fleet of AOPVs. Um, at this point in time, I'd probably say, depending on, on the bunking arrangement or how long we'd have them on board, uh, tops that we could probably look at is about 30 at this point in time. And now I have a question. Uh, could, you, could you speak a little bit more to uh, what you did during Op Nanook up in the north? Uh, so Op Nanook this year, what it consisted of is... Uh, we had a series of ships that went and worked with us, participated uh, from the exit of Halifax up to Nuke Greenland. Uh, we did multi-role, uh, multi-exercises. We did um, MIO Halux, so trying to identify um, the, the uh, and Intel giving us a, a bad ship and we had to go and track them down. We did uh, a SAR exercise between all of uh, all five, six ships. Um, so that was the first part that we went and did operating with our international partners. The second part was the longest part. And what that meant is that we just went and we went and patrolled the north. We went and interact with our northern communities. Um, we patrolled the areas and the the, the voice that we were using or the, the saying that we were using is uh, to, to see, see, so we wanted to see the Arctic ourselves, to see and be seen. So um, like we said, it's no secret that the Northwest Passage is opening up. Uh, the Arctic adventurers, I was surprised, blown away at how many uh, cruise ships were up north. So Every time that we saw a cruise ship within our Canadian waters, we would hail them, ask them some questions just to make sure that we're there. Uh, we had media personnel embarked and they covered different stages and reported back. Uh, so social media was a go. And we all know that our, our, our international partners follow social media and track social media as much. So the fact that we had social media reporting when we were up north, um, the fact that we were hailing uh, other countries' vessels, because it wasn't just Canadian vessels that were doing the Arctic exploring. Uh, there were fishing vessels right. we, up there. We lost you for a, a moment there. Oh. Um, you were surprised about something and you disappeared and we were all surprised that you. Oh, 
So uh, you can maybe I, just pull back a minute or two. Yeah, I was I was surprised at the number of cruise ships that were up there, our Arctic adventures. I was surprised by the number of sailing vessels going through the Northwest Passage. Um, so every time we saw these these ships or these boats, we would go and hail them just to make sure uh, or let them know that we're there and we're watching them. So um, it was it was is creating a presence up north, exuding our Canadian sovereignty. The fact that there's a gray hauled ship going and patrolling these waters, um, and, and we know that you're there it was the main part of Operation Enough. We went as far um, so as mentioned. So east was New Greenland. We went as far north as the polar ice cap, and we went as far west as Cambridge, which uh, Cambridge Bay is the same time zone as Alberta. So uh, just gives it a little bit perspective of how far east that we were able to go this year. Uh, we have a question from Edward Osborne. When dealing with northern communities, you get a sense that increased Canadian force projection and presence are desirable for the people living in those more remote areas. Did those community members um, share any perspectives in regards to near future changes in the Arctic? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the neat thing about the Arctic offshore patrol vessels is that we're also each affiliated with a, a northern uh, a community. So we got to go and have a lot of uh, community engagement and we had an affiliation ceremony with our uh, uh, Nanitsubit, sorry, it's a uh, northern, uh, northern Newfoundland and Labrador community. And so I was able to go and engage in conversations with the, the communities. And uh, I, I briefly mentioned it earlier in um, in, in the brief, we wanna work with the Northern communities to figure out how best to do the business up North. Uh, so them reporting, they report to uh, JTFN North, so out of Yellowknife. Uh, there's a reporting system mechanism in place that they can go and track uh, and they can report suspicious vessels. And we, we listen to them to go and say, what's like, how how was best? Where where are the vessels coming from? What time of the year? So it's that that community relations that we want to go and build with them. And uh, like I said, I just don't want to go up there and do business. So we we listen, we talk, and it's a collaborative effort as to figuring out how we're going to go and patrol up north. Are there any questions from the room before I carry on to the chat? Okay, I've uh, got one in the very back. You'll have to speak with that or come over. Well, I'm Major Dunn, Major CS Um, One question I have is when considering patrolling the Arctic, on the list of potential missions, I didn't see anti submarine warfare on there. And understanding your weapons capability isn't strong, but in terms of a sense capability, when you have an onboard helicopter, would that potentially be one of the potential missions is anti submarine uh, protection? Yeah, so once we get a helicopter on board, then that will be one one message or one way of detection. Uh, we're also working with our scientists, our DRDC, to go and figure out how to go and do um, passive acoustics so that we're not going and uh, harming the wildlife when we're up there. And there's a, a lot of research going on between um, about acoustic arrays up north. So. The, the brainiacs they're they're doing their business and they're they're figuring out how we can go and operate and for for detection up there so uh harry wolf's already trialed some passive uh passive sonar uh so it's a matter of tweaking um and figuring out uh the best way to go and do it so uh and once again it, it's uh i mentioned a plug and play and that that's exactly what it what was is the c can uh you plug it in uh and then all the equipment's on board so uh we're well on our way to go in and conduct, conducting the research and, and getting that uh, information uh, part of our, our routine up north. Thank you. Thank you. Um, another question. Uh, can you please describe in detail uh, the trip to 78 North? Example, is it open water? I, what's the ice coverage like? Oh, so we were, the reason why we pushed the envelope is that, um, we had a pretty clear passage up north. We had to go through some some old ice and you saw a picture of that. That was with the, the puddles. It looks like puddles there. So we had to go through a couple, probably about an hour, an hour and a half the old ice. Um, but then that, like the ice was actually quite, um, I don't know, quite thin and we could navigate our way up all the way up to the, the polar ice cap. 
what happened this year is that we were fortunate enough to go and work with um, uh, uh, a Coast Guard uh, ice specialist. Ice specialist. They go and interpret uh, the satellite um, photos. <laughs> Excuse me. And so by looking at the satellite photos and where we wanted to go, we were able to go and find our, our, our path of least resistance is what we like to call it. Um, and we could have gone further up into the polar ice cap, but at that point in time, I thought I was probably pushing my luck a little bit. Uh, so it was best just to turn around and start coming home. There was ice, there was flows, there was old ice, there were some bergs. Um, we, we saw some polar bears and walruses, uh, so it was, it was quite neat. And uh, the other good thing that was when we were doing it is that we were also in 24 hour sunlight. So it wasn't ever a surprise if we were gonna be coming up onto some ice or, or navigating our way uh, through the ice. So was it, was it chalkers? Was it like the meter thick that we can go and break through? No, um, there, there, like I said, there was probably I don't know, close to two hours that we had to go through of the, the thicker ice. And then other than that, we were able to pick our way through um, through some broken up flows. Okay. Thank you. Um, I have another question in the room. Go ahead. Yeah, ma'am. Uh, Lieutenant Bendongan, can you talk a little bit about the ship's complement in terms of uh, what it's made up of? Is there a reserve on board? Are there specific billets and things of that nature? Um, so as mentioned, we have room for 87 people on board. Our core crew is between 65 and 70. And Margaret Brook actually has um, 13 reserve billets allocated to us. Uh, those 13 billets fill anything from uh, our MarTech, so our, our engineers, uh, uh, cooks, uh, bosons, uh, we have supply uh, personnel. Uh, we also have uh, reserve naval warfare officers, uh, and we also have uh, reserve NCI ops. So pretty much all trades, uh, um, we can go and fill with the reserve positions on board the on board the ship. <coughs> Thank you very much, ma'am. Not a problem. They're a huge asset. Reservists are a huge asset to our, our crew as well. So um, do depending on the billets. So I mentioned our core crew is 65 to 70. I never try to sail like we have all the bunks full. So if I can take more people to go and do force generation, then I take them. Um, but just depending on um, what our mission set will require me to go and land certain people. So um, it's, it's, it's an ebb and flow of personnel, but uh, yeah, we do have reservists on board in all positions on board. Thank you. Um, Joe, you had a, you had a question. Would you like to go ahead? I did. Uh, and I go back to the strategic issue. Um, we may be all familiar with uh, Exercise Malabar, Japan, Australia, India, and the US and the Indian Ocean. Huge, huge multinational exercises. And similarly, off uh, South Korea more recently. I guess the question arises in exercising sovereignty up to the polar ice cap, does that, ex does that task lend itself to a multinational effort on the part of Canada and its allies, or is it, is it more a Canada only initiative? I mean, we're talking about speculation here. I appreciate that yeah. and, a, and a personal opinion. But just wondering whether or not you can see a multinational exercise on freedom of navigation and, and claims to sovereignty. Thank you. Yeah, most most definitely. So um, the frigates already participate in um, uh, a multinational exercise off Iceland. Uh, so it, it's a it's, it, I think it's an annual annual exercise or depending if we have a ship participating in NATO, they usually go and pop up to Iceland and, and uh, participate in that. So we're trying to get the, the we're trying to get these ships up there to participate in in that uh, that exercise as well, as well as the uh, multinational exercises off the coast of Norway. Uh, that's the ball tops Norway uh, and uh, and the, I guess more the Scandinavian countries as well. So it's just a matter of time before we get these ships there. Thank you. Thank you. So we have another question from uh, Raymond. You have your hand up. You can go ahead. 
Yes, uh, good evening, uh, Nicole. Thank you very much indeed for your presentation. Uh, I'm Chief of Staff of the British Defence Liaison Staff at the High Commission in Ottawa, so I'm close to your time zone, so I appreciate the lateness of the hour. Um, two, two questions, really. As a naval aviator myself, um, can you give us an update on the status of clearances for helos onto the AOPS class or the Harry de Wolf class? Uh, and secondly, apart from the elements and the omnipresence of uh, the Russian military, what do you think is the most immediate threat to security up in the Arctic at the moment? Is it illegal fishing? Is it wildlife trade? Is it smuggling? I'd like your opinions on that. Oh, those are good questions. So um, I don't really have an answer as for the aviation. Um, I know what our Navy tries to do is, um, we tried it last year, but unfortunately it was kind of short notice, is uh, we, we want to get the waivers granted so that uh, we can go and do the, the, the land-ons and all that stuff that's required. Um, so it's just, I said, it's just a, when you're working with the Air Force and the helicopters and air domain, it's, it's, it's time. It's unfortunately not a, a quick process. Um, but with lead time, we're trying to get the waivers in so that we can go and exercise with foreign uh, Navy's uh, helicopters. Um, as for my personal opinion as to what is the threat up north, um, I know it's really kind of hard to say. Uh, the, the, the illegal fishing goes and push it. They push the boundaries. Uh, they, they really do push the boundaries. Um, we, we were going and watching the surveillance of some, some fishing vessels off the coast of Canada, and they'd come up to, to the line and back away, come up to the line and back away, come up to the line, and they were there for months. So uh, would they head up north? I, I'm not sure. Um, but like I think one of the biggest threats that we can go and have is, uh, I keep talking about these Arctic adventures. If anything was to go and happen with one of these major cruise ships, and so the cruise ships are always putting people up on the ice. Um, uh, they're, yeah, they, they're, they're, the disruption to wildlife was, was a little bit concerned. We had to go and follow um, an Arctic adventure, a, a consort of three vessels that well, all had helicopters on them and they were going and interrogating the polar bears and their cubs. So it took us first shift and we went and hailed them saying, hey, make sure uh, you're abiding by your permits and, and that kind of stuff. So um, I think it's just a matter of people wanting to push the boundaries. And uh, working with our RCMP, they know that the, it's a matter of time before smuggling comes in through the through the Northwest Passage. So I think here we're top we're, we're touching base on all domains. Um, sneaky people want to do sneaky stuff. <laughs> So I, I didn't really answer your question, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, thank you very much. And in the future, if you want a helicopter, then I'm sure the Royal Navy will oblige. Excellent. <laughs> thank you for that. Um, so Lee Villager asked a question in the chat. Should this ship or should the ship suffer a breakdown or other unsuspected emergency in the high Arctic? Who or what is your backup? What's the drill to rescue the ship and the crew? Ah, so that's a good question because with these being new ships, it's always in the back of our mind as to what happens uh, up north. So fortunately, like our, our personnel are, are really highly trained. So uh, any kind of mechanical breakdown thus far, knock on some wood, uh, they've been able to go and fix and overcome. Uh, there's a lot of redundancies built in the ship. So uh, hopefully those keep up too. But um, we liaise uh, quite closely with Coast Guard. Uh, so uh, we're operating up north at the same time that Coast Guard is operating up north. Uh, and they're, they're sort of our backup if, if anything were to, to go wrong. And that, that's, that's vice versa for them too. If, if anything goes wrong, we're, we're there to go and help them out as well. Uh, thank you. Uh, another question. From a strategic perspective, how close is your connection to the Canadian Rangers? Uh, we're building those relationships. So uh, I won't say the ship has a good, uh, like a close relationship, but we go and liaise uh, regularly when we're operating up north with uh, JTFN, who uh, they they manage and have an excellent relationship with the uh, with the Rangers. Now I was able when we we're talking with our um, up in our affiliated community, uh, one of them Hopedale. I was talking with the Canadian Rangers, the the few Canadian Rangers uh, attached in that area. 
so very, they're always very eager to help out. Uh, we went into Pond Inlet and there's Canadian Rangers there to go and uh, meet our personnel and, and, and show, show our people around as well. So it's, but our, our key focus, our key liaison person is through JTFN, uh, who goes and then uh, puts, puts the, the paces on to go and, and make sure that one, we're supported by a, a Ranger or we know who to contact and vice versa. And I've got one last question here that I see in the chat. Can you discuss the resupply methods of your ship while sailing in the Arctic waters? Oh, yes, I can. Um, so uh, Nana Civic is in the process of being built. It's been in the process for about 10 years now. So uh, we really want that, uh, that fueling facility, that resupply uh, facility available to us because what resupply looked like this summer is that uh, one, we, uh, we go into Nuke Greenland to go and get our gas. Really, that's the only port that we can go into. Um, I ended up going and taking gas on a Nuke Greenland. Then there was uh, an MCDV that was operating with us up in, in the north. We went to anchor, the MCDV came alongside us and we went and fueled the MCDV so that they can go and extend their time up north. And then I had to go and chase around a commercial tanker for two weeks to go and um, get fuel from them. And let me tell you, my pucker factor, uh, after chasing this commercial tanker around the north for two weeks, finally went to, found a place to go to anchor. Uh, winds were less than ideal, 25 knots or so, gusting to 30. And then I had to go and uh, go alongside this ship, which at anchor is a moving, is a moving target, uh, tie up along them and, and transfer fuel. Uh, the, the chance of having uh, an environmental disaster for fuel spill up there was very great at that point in time. Uh, so Nana Civic needs to be built uh, so that we can go and fuel our ships and prolong our activities up north. And the other means that we had for resupply is that um, uh, we were able to get some flights of equipment into and food, because we don't want to take food away from the northern communities, uh, flights of equipment and food into uh, Resolute Bay uh, and Cambridge Bay. But it, it was not reliable. One, uh, one it's all weather-based, so uh, aircrafts are not on time. And then two, um, the airports themselves were going and suffering from uh, a fuel sort of shortage. So their flights weren't even flying regular flights. Um, any questions from the room before I have lost in the chat? No? I do have one other one in the chat here, and I think you've kind of already spoken to this, ma'am, but uh, uh, in terms of potential for, what is the potential for bunk space if a uh, Naval officer wanted to go out and do some training out with you guys. <laughs> we would love to take uh, take some na uh, naval warfare officers out. Uh, it's just a matter of finding our bunk space. And uh, uh, I'm not going to lie, we've given up cots. So uh, when we sailed for off Nanook, <laughs> we only have 87 bunks on board, but we sailed with 110 people. So a lot of people on cots. Um, and if there's bunk space, then uh, we'll take whoever we can. And especially this time of fourth generation, we're all about fourth generation. I love having extra people on board. Um, I see a question from William. Would you be able to just ask a question out loud, please? I guess that's for me. <laughs> uh, going back a number of years ago when uh, uh, Pierre Trudeau was in power, uh, the World Gas Association held an annual conference in Toronto at which one of the speakers proposed uh, sending super 747 uh, planes in a fleet up into the Arctic islands, drawing out uh, huge amounts of gas and bringing it down to certain uh, northern communities, such as Kapuskasi. And I know that was one of the communities. I haven't heard anything about that project in a long time. I'm wondering whether or not uh, uh, it's still active, whether you've heard anything about it, and if it were happened, uh, what disasters would you be looking at at trying to recover uh, 
uh, the whole mess that could happen uh, in the Arctic if for one reason or another a 747 blew up in the sky. Yeah, um, I don't know if this is going on. Um, I know that there, there are some fuel flights to go and get fuel to northern communities, but I also know that uh, a lot of the northern communities go and get their fuel um, via the tanker that we chased around for two weeks. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I, I can't speak to the, if it's a 24 hour circuit or the number of aircrafts that go and take fuel up. Uh, should one of these planes become disabled? Um, what concern would you have in relieving in such a disaster? Uh, well, we would be there for, uh, for search and rescue. Um, Environmental cleanup is not really a part of our mandate. We do carry some booms and all that stuff that we can assist with. That would fall under the Coast Guard uh, for uh, the disaster cleanup. Um, so it'd be a close liaison between um, Coast Guard and uh, what, we, what the Navy has available and also what's available for JTFN and the Army, uh, Army folks, because I'm sure it'd be an all joint effort to go in uh, and respond to that disaster. It was a great project. <laughs> yeah. okay, thank you very much, Tom. Are there any other questions from anyone, um, either in the Zoom audience or here at the Pepsi? Great. Uh, seeing no other questions, Tom, I want to thank you very much for a very forward presentation today. Uh, I think we all learned a lot. So, and we really appreciate you taking the time. I know it's late in the evening for you. So, thank you again very much. Thank you very much. And once again, thank you for asking me to go and, uh, and do this presentation. I hope it was informative. Um, and I hope I answered some of your questions. Some, some tough questions, tough crowd. <laughs> Good for you. Thank you.